Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday, until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 189, March 25th, 2015. Dr. Scove goes to Dayton. Good evening, everybody. It's Ham Nation time. I got a note in the mail today from Dave saying it's Ham Nation time. So here we are. This is Bob Heil, K9EID, in really awful weather in the Ozarks. Uh, tornadoes in northern Ar uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma got nailed again with stuff. Uh, but we've been yelling for spring for a long time. Well, it's here and it brings, you know what, storms. So uh, we'll have to put up with it. But radio signals are pretty good other than some of the static, but even that's pretty good. We have a great show tonight. We've got some uh, absolute incredible announcements from Don and uh, George has on a fantastic shirt and then there's Gordo and lots going on. Dale's going to be here with a lot of videos and pictures. Randy's going to tell us how to use that analyzer we talked about last week. But uh, Gordo's got some news about some ham fests and things, I think. So Gordon West in Costa Mesa, how are you? I bet the weather's fine there, huh? Uh, yeah, everything is fine here, and we wish the best for those in tornado country. This weekend, uh, the 28th Greater Houston Ham Fest in Brazos Valley, uh, sponsored by the Brazos Valley Amateur Radio Club. And uh, the Dayton bus, remember Dayton coming up, uh, the Dayton bus sponsored by NADXA Group is looking for riders. So if you want to go to Dayton in a bus rather than driving, uh, get a hold of NADXA Group. And uh, coming up this weekend, this Saturday, is also the big get-together, the final open house for ham radio outlet Plano. And Raj of Alinko is going to be there, and he may have some digital announcements uh, for you. And finally, speaking of digital, we're told that if you go to a Skype club meeting, and Bob and I and George and Don, we do a bunch of those meetings via Skype, make sure everybody turns off their cell phone because what they're finding is the modern router these days will hiccup when it sees a cell phone I'm here and will uh, drop the Skype contact. So if you're one of the clubs that Bob and I will be Skyping to, uh, be sure you tell everybody in the group, go to the airplane mode on the cell phone so you don't upset the wireless router to hiccup and then drop the Skype uh, contact. Finally, for DX, of course, a lot of DX this weekend, but the um, the big DX, International DX Convention, Visalia, coming up April 17, 18, and 19. Bob, back to you. Okay, yeah, that's great news uh, uh, about the uh, the Skype stuff. I, uh, I got an announcement of that, too, so I guess we're going to have to start turning our phones off when we're on Skype. Mm -hmm. I've got some news before we... Uh, Carry on here a little bit. I, I got a, a note, nice note from the uh, the Dayton Hamvention, and we're on again. The Ham Nation will have a forum this year. It's at ten thirty on Saturday, Room One, the big room one Saturday, 
at 1030 in the morning. That's May 16th. So uh, make your reservations early. You probably should go in there and get a seat now the way it looks. The last few years it was packed and we'll uh, probably have a lot of other people there. So uh, that's the news. Uh, the people at, uh, at DARA that run the Hamvention have given us uh, actually almost two hours uh, on Saturday, room one, 1030. Just so you know, that's happening. And I got a note from Jim, KD9GY, and he wants to uh, know if we're going to be signing people up to help. And yes, we are. So we need somebody to step up, send me, Gordo, Don, George, send one of us an email and say, let me it. And um, I think last year it was Steve. I'm not sure who it was, uh, actually. But I think we need somebody to, to make the sign up of, uh, when people will help us man the Ham Nation booth. Now, uh, that's another thing that, that Dara has given Ham Nation is a booth. We have a separate booth. And uh, we get to talk to a lot of hams that don't know about Ham Nation and get to see a lot of your friends that do watch it. So it's kind of a fun thing. So we need somebody to say, okay, I'll coordinate that. So uh, everything is on for Dayton. I just wanted to let everybody know, and we're extremely happy about that. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue on, and uh, I'm not sure um, uh, what all we'll be doing yet. We'll let you know, but we're going to have fun. And I forgot to mention, we're going to have another new ham sec uh, segment here in a little bit. So uh, get out your pens and pencils, and uh, Kristen's going to be in here giving you some information about some new hams. And uh, we want to we take these guys' calls down and send them a QSL card, send them an e-note, uh, let them know that we really welcome to this great hobby. Gordo, you're the responsible person for so many. I get so many emails that, man, I got my license because of Gordon, and we all appreciate what you have done to help all of us, me included, uh, get our license, and uh, I, I appreciate it personally. So uh, glad to have you. What, what you got on your agenda there? You're going to talk about something we talked about last week. <laughs> Well, of course, this is the ham radio favorite accessory, the MFJ SWR analyzer. This one does HF, VHF, uh, and um, they have one that also does UHF, all in one compact package. But some folks said um, we, we really can't afford like $370. Doesn't MFJ have something in the $100 area? And the answer is they do. Uh, MFJ makes a UHF antenna analyzer that looks at SWR. Uh, MFJ makes a VHF SWR analyzer that looks at SWR for around $100. Uh, MFJ makes a high frequency SWR analyzer. And I've got to adjust the radio here. Everybody said, well, but how do you know where the frequency is if it doesn't have a readout? Well, listen to the background noise on the radio, and I'll swing this back and forth. Hear the whoop, 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 whoop? Yeah, that means uh, we're set on 14219 when we zero beat that noise. So with the radio uh, nearby, just stick a coat hanger or a paper clip in the back, and you'll hear the... Uh, signal that's generated by the SWR analyzer, and that's a little $100 analyzer, so you know you're right on. Finally, from MFJ, this is a great way to measure antenna currents on a long wire antenna, and that's another handy device, an RF current meter. And finally, from last week, we've talked all about the impedance matcher. This is the big guy, even has a build-in dummy load, and this is an inductance impedance matcher, and that's what we recommend inductance in that uh, it bleeds off the static when you've got uh, high winds, hopefully not tornadoes, but high winds, uh, dry winds blowing across that antenna when you're mobile. So that's neat stuff from MFJ. You don't have to spend $3.95. It certainly is good, though, to see exactly what the impedance is. But you know you have an impedance mismatch if you're looking at it on one of these meters and it never bottoms out to one-to-one. -to -one. So the big one helps, but the little ones will still get the job done. So that's my report, and we'll be watching WB6NOA. Back to you, Bob. Okay, Gordo. Well, we're going to uh, learn how they how to work them 
Uh, we now know that they exist, but uh, Randy's uh, tooling up here to show us how to do that in a while. But in the meantime, we have a word from the great people at ICOM. From new models to classic radios, there's something for everyone this season. So get out or hunker down with ICOM. Celebrate ICOM's 50th year with the IC7850. Only 150 units are available, and each radio features 1.2 kilohertz optimized roofing filter, a new local oscillator design with improved phase noise, several spectrum scope enhancements, and distinct gold accents on the front panel and commemorative label. For contesters just starting out this year, ICOM's IC7600. You get advanced DSP technology and IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. Got cabin fever and need to get away? Get mobile with ICOM's IC2730A and ID5100A. The analog 2730A mobile and digital 5100A with built-in GPS. Both feature optional Bluetooth capability for hands-free operation, 50 watts output power on both VHF and UHF, and a large backlit screen. For entry-level D-Star operation, take the ID888H on the road. Features include a good menu structure and VHF-UHF dual-band functionality, one band at a time. Time. To hunker down or get out, the ID51A Plus is a perfect radio to enjoy global communications. This dual bander has the free downloadable RSMS1A Android app, enhanced DV functionality, and additional D Plus reflector link commands. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM's base stations, mobiles, and portables. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Throw your name in the hat and learn how you can win in the monthly grand prize drawing. You'll be eligible for prizes like uh, swag, T-shirts, hats, etc. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Check out the official rules there and check out all of ICOM's previous drawing winners. For March, the grand prize is going to be the IC2730 a analog dual bander with optional Bluetooth headset. 50 watts on both VHF and UHF, dual band, dual watch, and a large backlit LCD display and a lot more. So sign up, good luck, and don't forget to follow ICOM America on Facebook and on Twitter. So icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Go register now. You still have a chance to get in on that March drawing. And now let's go back to Bob and see what's next. Well, we have a, 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 another segment from Christian. I'm, I'm really excited about this because we have a lot of people in our audience that are new hams. We have a lot of people that want to be new hams. And um, Christian's taken this really uh, run with it. We, we appreciate it. And uh, he's going to give us another segment tonight. So let's see what's coming out of here, out of St. Louis, from Christian. Well, on the last episode, we started off with a new ham from the Pacific Northwest, way up there in the corner in the state of Washington. This time, we're going to the East Coast in the Northeast and visit with Marty, KC1CWF. Good to be with you, Marty. Thanks for coming by. Well, thanks for having me here tonight, Christian. Uh, it's really great to uh, be here on Ham Nation. Uh, thanks for having me out. You're welcome. Now, some of the old school hams are thinking, wow, we're really going new school here. I mean, here you are. Last year, you were just 12 years old. Now, I hope I'm not going to mess things up with the ladies with you. But 12 years old, you get your technician license. Here we are in 2015, and you've upgraded to, to general. Tell us a little bit about how you found ham radio. So I've, uh, since I was little, really, I've always been interested in radio and technology. I, I, my parents always tell me stories of when I was uh, four or five and I'd have extension cords being run around the house and uh, plugging things in and whatnot. And I, from a young, uh, from when I was really little, I remember I have my uh, uh, FRS walkie-talkies and uh, all that cool stuff. And uh, I, I, I always read about the uh, prepper preparedness uh, thing and uh, I was never really into it but I used to watch the TV shows and there was always guys with these big clunky ham radios and in their Faraday cage and whatnot and I found it really interesting and they'd be talking to people on the other side of the world and he would they would talk about how if something ever happened we'd be able to communicate and all that and I really find I really found it really interesting how 
there's no infrastructure. We just have antennas and we have radios and we can talk around the world. Um, and I really enjoy that. So um, I made the plunge and I found out that there is hams in Massachusetts, which I thought, oh, there are probably no hams around here. And I started studying and studying. And then I uh, went on the ARRL's website and I found out there was a test session probably three weeks before I'd want to take it. And I figured, oh, I'll just try and take the test. So I studied for my technician. I didn't know any hams. I wasn't involved in ham radio. I didn't have a book. I didn't go to a class. I just studied with the, an a application on my iPad. And I went and I uh, took my technician license test and I passed. And I was mainly on two meters and uh, talked to a lot of great people on the local repeater. And I really learned a lot that way. And I thought that was really great. And I, uh, and I did lots of rag chewing, met a lot of people and just took in a lot of information. And then um, this winter, while I was in Florida over Christmas break, uh, my school had uh, two weeks off when we were in Florida to visit my grandparents. And I told my grandfather, I'm a ham now. And he's like, oh, I know a friend who's a ham. So he took me over to his house um, and I was able to get on the air and I made my first contact on the air and I will never forget it. I worked Whiskey One Alpha Whiskey Portable 3. So uh, the ARRL uh, club station uh, during their uh, centennial celebration, which I thought was really cool. And it kind of just took off from there. I uh, what was it like when you made that first contact? I remember for me, uh, it was my Elmer, and he, w he was in the same state, but it took a lot for us to get my rig together, the coax cable, figuring out my radio, learning things like that, getting the antenna up in the air. But I remember hearing my call signs coming back to me and this feeling in my stomach. And I've been a broadcaster for a long time now, and behind a mic, I, I suddenly got a little shy on the mic all of a sudden. Did you experience for one, what did it feel like to make your first contact? And two, did you have a little shyness on the mic going in? Well, I've been, I've always been a rather uh, talkative person, man. Um, so I, I, I was on two meters a lot. So I was used to talking to people and pressing the, the push to talk and uh, saying whatever I had to say. And it was really interesting. Um, the first time, and I had no idea what W1AW or uh, the Centennial was. I was just some technician who was on two meters and I, I thought I knew a good chunk of stuff but I really didn't and um, I, I remember making that contact and then just uh, it was a very short exchange it was I was I was KC1 CWF 4 and I just I yeah I threw in my call sign into the rather large pile up they came back to me gave them a signal report and that was that and I remember after that just sitting there mesmerized I'm like what happened and that really just gave me the disease that you can't get rid of, so. It is really addicting. I find antennas are addicting. And the first time you work a little DX, I started to test my antenna. I just wanted to see who I could reach. So, you know, here I am, I dial it in a little bit. I'm on 15 meters. And before you know it, I get a call back from Romania or Italy and it freaked me out. I'm like, whoa, wait, I'm not even supposed to be uh, hitting anything on 15 meters, but that wire up in that old oak tree got me there. And then the next thing you know, I'm into this, I'm not a contester, but when the contests are happening, that's a great way to make a lot of contacts. You seem to be somebody that's really into the DX contesting angle. Is that true? Yeah, I do like contesting and everything that goes along with that. Actually, uh, um, a few weeks ago uh, was the ARRL DX contest, and uh, I operated multi-operator um, with a few with my uh, probably what I would call the uh, family of Elmers and people I've really learned from. A friend of mine who's actually a year younger than me, KC1AHI, and his father, KC1AHJ, who are both extras, and they really took me under their wing. I met them once. We both enjoyed AHF, and then uh, we I stayed over at the, I met them a few more times, and I stayed over at their house during the contest. And under my call sign, we worked 51 DXCC entities, which was just huge for me. And I know you're studying for your extra class license. How's that going? Have you be begun the study? Yes, I have. And uh, I live uh, about an hour and a half train ride away from school. So I, um, I, I read my uh, Gordo's uh, book on the uh, train, and that's how I practice. Uh, he'll be happy to have another great, young, bright mind 
and a student. Uh, so congratulations on all of your success. I look forward to working you on the air. We should set something up because I'd like to take this segment and everybody we introduce here on Ham Nation, the new hams. I'd like to work you. Maybe record that and uh, maybe we'll get into some trouble together with some projects. I've got some solder around. I'll give it to you because you seem like you know what you're doing. Well, uh, thanks for that. And I would love to uh, meet up on the air with you. I can as for Ham Nation, I'm often found on the 20-meter uh, post-show net of Ham Nation, so it would be great to see you there. You got it. Marty KC1CWF, thanks for joining us here. We appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He, he, he called this a disease. <laughs> he got a disease. Guess what? It is. I've had it for almost <laughs> 60 years. And it won't go away. I don't want it to go away. What a great piece. Um, man, oh, man. And it was really, really great. But uh, as uh, all of you noticed, uh, <clears throat> Kristen isn't working from a, a soapbox there. Man, what a beautiful studio, Christian. Um, he'll be on in a, a weekend, the program after. I think we'll have to have, get him on here live, and we'll have to all ask him a bunch of questions because... He is uh, the ultimate pro. Uh, I'm sure you remember it, how he and I met and how we got him here. And I think I kind of instilled this disease in you, Christian. <laughs> so, uh, oh gosh, it's just, uh, it's the best thing ever. And uh, Marty, you're uh, you're just doing so good. I'll try to catch up with you on the air somewhere. That'll be great. Oh, uh, before I. Uh, Go to Don. I want to tell you guys that we're really excited about this uh, this booth. So you want to talk this up on the chat room or emails together, and we need somebody to pick that up and uh, make sure that we can get signed up for for different times is what the deal is. So we can have a nice orderly uh, deal there at Dayton. I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be great, and of course the forum is going to be super. Don, um, how did you like that um, <laughs> that disease? Uh, you have this disease. You have this disease. Yeah. Oh, yeah. look at this. I'm just I'm t I guess I'm a little light reading. I, I picked this up at the Rain Louisiana Ham Fest, and it's a great book. But it was it was it was in the bargain bin because look, some some yahoo wrote all over the front of it. <laughs> so he <laughs> wrote on the front of it. Yeah. What's that? Uh, and apparently he he wrote all these words on the inside as well, so that's that's a that's a cool thing. So, uh, good got my got myself a copy of the of the Big Blue Book, and uh, if anyone doesn't have a copy of the Big Blue Book, well, you need to need to get a copy of that. We've got some some cool stuff in the news tonight, and we have a very special announcement um, following uh, Amateur Radio Newsline. So why don't we get to Amateur Radio Newsline, and then we'll get to this amazing announcement that is going to shock and amaze and have you uh, gasping for breath. So let's check out the news, shall we? From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 1,957, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, March 25th, 2015. Another big surprise from Sunspot AR2297 as it hurls a massive solar flare towards the Earth. March 15th began with a solar bang. Between 0045 and 0200 UTC, a magnetic filament erupted in concert with a slow C9-class solar flare from Sunspot AR2297 that hurled a coronal mass ejection, or CME, into space. At that time, modeling by analysts suggested that the cloud would deliver a glancing blow to Earth's magnetic field during the late hours of March 17th. They also estimated there will be a 50% chance of geomagnetic storms when the CME arrived but they were in for quite a surprise. A severe storm smacked Earth with a surprisingly big geomagnetic jolt on Tuesday, March 17th. Two blasts of magnetic plasma that left the sun separately combined and arrived on Earth about 15 hours earlier and much stronger than expected. Forecasters figured it would come late Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. Instead, it arrived just before 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The storm ranked a four on the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration's one to five scale for geomagnetic effects. It's the strongest solar storm to blast Earth since the fall of 2013. It's been nearly a decade since a level 5 storm termed extreme has hit the Earth. It had forecast to arrive at a level 1. Packing winds of close to 200 miles per hour, Category 5 Cyclone Pam caused severe damage when it hit the Pacific nation of Vanuatu on March 13th. 
Vanuatu's government declared a nationwide state of emergency, and Australia and New Zealand were among the first to send in relief supplies. The cyclone tore apart the infrastructure on Vanuatu's 12 inhabited islands and all but isolated it from the world. And as far as we've been able to determine, this was a case where not even amateur radio could fill in the communications gap, mainly because there are very few resident hams living there, nor does there seem to be an established emergency calling frequency on any of the amateur bands. About the closest thing to a ham radio response frequency might be the Pacific Maritime Maritime net and 14.300 megahertz, but what assistance, if any, was provided by this group is unknown as we go to air. Nor is it known if the non-ham radio Vanuatu net, which operates daily at 2030 UTC during cruising season on 8.230 megahertz, was activated. The restoration of communications with Vanuatu required first responders from other nations arriving with their own communications gear, primarily satellite phones. It was only then that the full extent of the devastation that Cyclone Pam caused to Vanuatu was made known to the world. Amateur radio likes to claim that it's there when all other means of communications have failed. But in this case, there simply were no hams on Vanuatu to respond. Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper has signed into law an amateur radio antenna bill that mirrors the PRB1 federal preemption policy. Hickenlooper put his signature on the measure on March 13th after the Colorado General Assembly, without amendment, passed Senate Bill 15-041, which had been introduced in early January. Bill 15-041 specifies that no local government shall enact or enforce an ordinance or resolution regulating amateur radio antennas that fails to conform with PRB1's reasonable accommodation provisions. This measure was jointly sponsored by Colorado Senator Chris Holbert and Representative Kevin Van Winkle. According to Colorado Section Manager Jack Siaccia, WM0 G. This was truly a bipartisan bill with terrific support from both sides of the aisle in both legislative chambers. Wireless energy generation from space is now one small step closer to becoming a feasible delivery source of power. Here's Amateur Radio Newsline Stephen Kenford, N8WB. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, also known as JAXA, conducted the research, which sent 1.8 kilowatts of electricity 170 feet through the air in the form of microwave radiation. The beam was transmitted with a great degree of accuracy, showing the technique may be used on a larger scale. Engineers at JAXA have spent years researching new technologies to enable the delivery of energy from space-based solar collectors down to our home planet. Solar cells commonly power satellites, space probes, and the International Space Station. However, delivering that power to Earth in an economical manner is still a challenge facing developers. Now researchers say that the sun's energy might one day be collected by massive solar panels in space, and the energy generated from the systems could be sent to Earth in the form of highly directional microwaves. Engineers believe that a full network to generate electricity in space will not be available until sometime in the 2040s. And finally, there's a new youth net on HF. Justin Gilder, AC8PI, has announced the creation of a new high-frequency youth net. Its purpose is to serve as a meeting place for young hams on the HF bands and to provide short contacts between those who have checked in. Let's not for it on 20 meters between 14320 and 14330 megahertz on Sunday afternoon between 1800 and 1900 UTC. That's between 2 and 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for over 37 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. For Stephen Kenford, N8WB, I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. And now here's Dr. Tamitha Scove with your solar update. Hi, I'm Tamitha Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of March 25th. We're coming down off of the high from that huge solar storm that we had last week, and the sun has really begun to quiet down. In fact, we've had very little activity in terms of flares or in terms of eruptions. The biggest eruption we've had is from this filament that erupted back late on the 22nd, which might have a slight earthward-directed com component. Outside of that, we had another wispy solar storm erupt kind of from this or coral the hole region right here. But outside of those, we've really only had some fast wind that have been hitting Earth recently. Switching to our M flare threat meter, you can see the last M flare we had was back on the 18th. That's when that region 2297 began to rotate around to the west limb. Since then, everything has kind of died down and it's continued to be quiet until about the last 24 hours or so, where we're beginning to see uh, flare activity pick up again since new regions have been rotating around the east limb. Now, we are currently experiencing slightly elevated levels of radiation right now, and these levels are well below the NOAA S1 storm level threshold. But nonetheless, if you're worried about GPS navigation or you amateur radio operators, you might see some uh, very minor issues, especially at high latitudes, over the next couple of days until this, these elevated radiation levels die down. 
Now switching to your storm levels, you can see the huge impact of that monster geomagnetic storm that happened over St. Paddy's Day. And on the back side of that storm, as it began to calm down on the 18th, it was compounded by a high speed stream that had some fast wind in there. And so it just made the effects of that storm linger on day after day. And then we'd have little minor disturbances, little wispy solar storms in the solar wind that would just pop us back over storm levels because it never really got the, gave the Earth's field a chance to kind of settle down. And now only since about the 23rd or 24th have we started to really see the field settle back down uh, and go back into a normal condition. So this week has definitely calmed down compared to last week, but it's not completely quiet. We have region 2305 that could be an M flare contender in the coming days. Regarding solar storms, we are finally settling down from the lingering effects of that monster solar storm we saw last week. And thank goodness for that, because I know the amateur radio bands have been an absolute disaster this past week. Outside of that, we do have the possibility of a glancing blow on about the 27th from yet another solar storm, but these should be minor effects. Nonetheless, you might see some GPS, and again, your amateur radio bands might be a little bit affected, but it shouldn't be too bad. Outside of that, we might get some gorgeous aurora photos again. Uh, probably nothing like what we've seen in the past couple weeks, though. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. We have a very exciting... Uh, announcement for you that actually, well, it, it all ties together. So, Brian, go ahead and run run that special thing right there, which please. Dr. Tamitha Scove, you have a PhD in geophysics and planetary physics. You have the unique talent of making a very complicated subject easy for everyone to understand. Your solar updates on Ham Nation have made you the darling of the amateur radio community. What are you doing next? I'm going to the Dayton Hamvention. Join Tim Duffy, K3LR, and Dr. Tamitha Scove at the 2015 Dayton Hamvention Antenna Forum, Friday, May 15th, 2 p.m. in Forum Room 1. Tamitha Scove, Arecibo, antenna analyzers, and more. Check hamvention.org for full details. How you like that? Dr. T is going to Dayton. That is exciting okay. news. Yes, she's going. Tim Duffy... And Yasmi, they're bringing her to the uh, to the the antenna forum on Friday, and uh, I'm sure she'll make her way to the Ham Nation booth as I have instructed her to do so. I just wish that this was a Dayton year for me. I would uh, I'd, I'd walk her around that place like uh, nobody's business. But uh, I'll be here, and she'll be there with you guys. So so treat her nice, would you please? Yeah. So Doctor Scove is going to Dayton. Very exciting news. George, what's going on in Smoke and Solder? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about antenna analyzers tonight. You know, uh, Gordo showed us one a while ago. Well, MFJ makes more than just one antenna analyzer. Uh, this is about half of them right here, but uh, a lot of different models to choose from. They all do something a little different. But Randy's going to show us a little bit about his this week. Hi, Randy, K7AGE. I'm going to talk about antenna analyzers a little bit today. MFJ sells many different analyzers. Their 259 series, and there's several variations, is very popular. I have a 269, which is basically the same thing, but covers 70 centimeters. So these antenna analyzers offer a lot of different test functionality. The one we're going to look at today is frequency and SWR. When you're putting up a new antenna, you want to check to see where the antenna is resonant. Make sure it's where you had thought it was going to be. And the analyzer helps you measure that and determine if you need to make it longer or shorter. So the alternative to an antenna analyzer is an SWR bridge or meter or the SWR meter in your radio. Although these require you to transmit. The antenna analyzer is nice because it's off air. It's also makes it easy to take out in the field versus taking your radio out. So we'll look at an SWR meter first and then we'll show you doing the same measurements with the MFJ analyzer. First here I'm going to show you using the SWR meter that's in my Drake antenna tuner, which I'm not using as a tuner, it's just in bypass. I'm going to be using my 40 meter dipole. I have my K3 set to about 7.2 megahertz. And the way a SWR meter works is that there's usually some type of full scale adjustment. So on here I push this knob in and transmit and set the meter for full scale and let go of that and then transmit and on the SWR here it's reading 
about 1.75. Or if you have a real fancy power meter, it may also give you an SWR measurement. Just hit the button, the key, and it tells me it's 1.6. So 1.6 on this meter, 1.7 on the other. Yeah, they're close enough. Now let's take a look at using the antenna analyzer to do this as well. Okay, this is what the antenna analyzer looks like. This is a 269, it does 70 centimeters. The 259 is basically the same thing. These things have changed over the years with different knobs and different information being displayed, but they're all kind of the same. Um, there's a knob here for tuning the frequency. There's a basically a, a band switch that selects between different frequency ranges. And on the top is where your antenna can plug in and the MFJ you can put internal batteries, but I don't use it that often, so I power mine off an external 12 volt gel cell. There's a couple things you should be aware of. You never want RF going into the meter from a transmitter. You'll blow up the front end. They recommend that you short the center to ground to discharge any static before connecting the coax. Also, if you're in an area with a high RF environment, like if you have a AM broadcast station nearby, you may get erroneous readings on the meter. Okay, so the way this works, you turn the meter on, it goes through a little self-check, tells you the software MFJ, tells you the battery's okay, and then it's in the basic impedance or SWR checking. The, I have it on the 4 to 10 megahertz scale because I'm checking a 40 meter dipole, which is 7 megahertz, and this knob then allows you to tune. There's a meter here that shows SWR, and on the 269, it actually also shows you SDR, SWR digitally in the top. And, and this shows you the impedance, and we're aiming for 50 ohms. So basically what you do is that you tune this, and you can see the dip here in SWR, and the frequency here is 7.00. So it's, my antenna is actually resonant at the very bottom of the band, which is really not good. I should change that, which means I need to raise it, which means I need, need to shorten the antenna. But for right now, this is what we have. So, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to check the SWR in 7 megs at 100 kC intervals and see what the, the range looks like. So we know at 7.0 or 699, it's at 1 to 1, so that's uh, 1.0. And we raise this, we just tune this up to 7.1, it's, it's a little quick on the tuning. So it just, yeah, there's close enough. Okay, that's uh, 1.2. I can go up to 7.2, it's 1.5, so you can see the SWR is rising. I go up to 7.3, and it's 1.8. Now what's really nice with these, you can go outside of the amateur band. So let's just, um, so you go down here to 6.9, and 6.8, and 6.7 here, and see what my SWR is. Looking for 690. Okay. That's 1.2. Uh, on the 6 6.8, 1.6, 6.7, 2.1. Yep. As you can see, the antenna is resonant at 7 megahertz. Now that's right at the very bottom of the 40 meter band. If I was a phone operator, I would probably want to, since I have to move it higher, I'd have to shorten up the antenna to bring the SWR from 1.5 down. Although just about all radios will work into a 1.5 or 1.8 SWR without any problems. Okay, so I've taken my data versus frequency and plotted out a, a graph, real simple, and I can see that my 7.0 is where it's resonant. And again, if I wanted to shift this graph higher, I'd have to shorten up the antenna. So I quickly showed how to use an MFJ antenna analyzer. And almost any analyzer will do these basic functions of showing SWR versus frequency. You do several measurements, and you can make yourself a little graph. The fancy meters have a display that shows you the graph, and you can probably plug it into a computer to store the information. I recommend you get, a, get one of these notebooks, record all your station information manually, Go in and uh, do the plots for each one of your antennas. Maybe if you have an antenna tuner, record down all the settings so you can quickly go back. 
Uh, if you have an amplifier, you can record all the settings in your notebook of where the, how to tune up your amplifier. And then over time, if something changes, you can go back and check your notebook to see what it was because sometimes the old memory isn't uh, quite what we think it is. So anyway, that's a quick overview of an antenna analyzer and how it can be useful. It's a nice piece of test gear. as one of my original Elmers that invest in test gear. Thanks for watching. This is Randy, K7AGE. And that's a great segment there, Randy. You know, um, a lot of people don't, don't use antenna analyzers, never have. Once you've used one, though, you really, um, you never want to be without it. This is currently my favorite right here. This is the MFJ225. Randy showed you how he plotted out the, the numbers there on a chart. Well, this antenna analyzer does it right here, so you can see the whole bandwidth of your antenna at once. Like I say, it's my favorite for doing antenna work. Uh, it's got the USB output on it as well. However, the one Randy showed you there, the MFJ259B, is the most popular antenna analyzer in the world, and it does more than just measure your antenna impedance and um, resistance and reactance. You know, it... It does some other things, too, like uh, you can measure inductors with it, capacitors. You can check the length of a piece of coax and a lot of other things. So while I like this one and the graphic capabilities, the 259B will actually do uh, a few more measurements just uh, because of the way it's built. So a great piece of test gear. Uh, you might want to consider getting an antenna analyzer if you don't already have one, or at least every club ought to own one because you can swap it around between uh, different members if you need to. And if you've got a friend who's got one, well, you may not need one, but at least one person in your group needs a good analyzer. And, uh, boy, everybody will really be his best buddy after that because I have a lot of people that uh, uh, friends that come by here and um, we check their antennas and such um, whenever they get a new one, and it uh, really saves a lot of time. Well, you know, we were talking about Dayton Hamvention a little earlier, and I'm looking forward to meeting Dr. Scove there, and uh, I'm glad to find out that uh, Saturday morning at 1030 in Room 1 is when we're going to do the Ham Nation Forum this year, and I'm glad we got that larger room there because, like Bob said, we always pack that out, so you want to get there early for that, and uh uh, as he mentioned, you know, uh, send us an email, to, uh, at least to one of us, and let us know if um, you'll be available to kind of help us move in and out the PA gear or whatever we need to do because we have to get in and out of that room pretty quick. But I'm also just winding up details right now, and uh, my partner Tommy and I are going to shoot a live episode of Amateur Logic from the ICOM booth that Saturday afternoon from 2 to 4. It's uh, not just your typically uh, running around with a camera uh, shooting stuff at Hamvention. It's actually going to be a, a regular episode of our show that's going to be shot there at the ICOM booth. So we're really looking forward to that and let you know some more details as it gets a little closer. And uh, also we're going to be shooting Ham College Friday night at 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time. If you want to see that, come over to amateurlogic.tv and uh, check out our new Ham College. You know, this week on the contest, I have gotten more entries than I typically get. And there's a good reason for that. And that's because we're going to give away a pair of these. I, I didn't have them handy last week when we talked about this. It's a set of Heil Pro Set 3s, but however, Don and Bob and Gordo, fortunately, all had them right handy there. And there's a reason we all have them handy. They really sound great. So I'm going to give away a pair of those tonight. And I had asked a question last week, and this came from the uh, Amateur Radio Technician exam. What type of component is often used as an adjustable volume control? And the answers were A, a fixed resistor, B, a power resistor, C, a potentiometer, or D, a transformer. And we got a winner here. Sorry, we can only have one, but that is Brian Smith, KI6ERR, and he said the answer is C, a potentiometer. So congratulations, Brian. We're going to get those out here to you in the next few days. You're really going to enjoy these. A great set of stereo headphones. Uh, for next week, though, we've got uh, another question, and we're going to give away, uh, well, 
an MFJ universal belt clip that'll fit any handy talkie. Slip it in there, clip it on your belt. And we're also going to give away this telescopic uh, antenna for your handy talkie. It's a VHF UHF antenna that has an SMA male on it. That means this is going to fit most of your uh, Poplar brand handy talkies. Uh, I know it'll fit my ID51 just fine, so I hate to give it away, but we're going to. And if you'd like to win that, then answer this for me. This also comes from the technician exam. Which of the following describes combining speech with an RF carrier signal? It's A, impedance matching, B, oscillation, C, modulation, and D, a low-pass filter. So if you think you know the answer to that, well, send your answer to me at hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you could be next week's lucky winner. And right now, I'm looking over at my computer because I'm not sure where we're going next. I think I know. And uh, yes, I'm right. It's time to bring Don back in here and talk a little bit about DX engineering. So take it away, Don. And answer me this, smart guy, Mr. Smoke and Solder. You can use those... Uh... Use those uh, antenna analyzers to find faults in your coax, can't you? You certainly can, and I have used it for that before. It'll find either an open or a short, and uh, it'll tell you how long or how far down that line your problem is. So a really yeah. amazing piece of test equipment. Well, you don't need one to find the fault in this piece of coax because there's a there's a slight issue with this piece of coax. And coax is very important. I bring that up because DX Engineering is to coax cable what Stradivarius is to the violin. These guys eat, sleep, breathe everything about cable building. And why is it important? Well, like I said, faulty, incorrectly prepared coaxial cable can induce RF interference give you premature cable failure due to corrosion. And the DX Engineer and coaxial cable assemblies are all built using precision machines, and the center pins are hand-soldered to ensure the best connection possible. Now, of course, you can do your own uh, PL plugs and stuff if you want to, because this right here certainly ain't going to... You can't cram this into the back of your radio, for crying out loud. Well, you could, but, you know, what, what good would that be? That's why you need one of these dudes right here. You know what that is? Let me get that real nice and close. Let's see if you can see that. That's, that's the brand-new... Patent pending hybrid PL259 has the best qualities of both the crimp on and the solder on. Now, if you take that and, and compare it to the uh, other PL259 on here, um, you can see the difference. If I can get this in the shot here, it's uh, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not much of a cameraman, but anyway, I want you to you, you get it, everything is in the DX Engineering catalog, so go check that out also at dxengineering.com. But anyway, they uh, it's, it's a great, great piece of, of gear. Um, patent pending hybrid PL259, best qualities of both crimp on and solder on. Uh, these features make it ideal for single or double shielded coax cable. A silver plated center pin has a deep scallop, promotes excellent solder flow inside the uh, conductor. The conductor's enhanced crimp shield creates 360 degrees of electromechanical continuity. Each one has PTFE insulations for optimal isolation. The overall design of the connector Helps prevent arcing uh, within the SO239 mating connector. It gives you a low loss connection. And the new PL259 is installed along with heat shrink tubing. You can see it right there when I held it up to the camera. Makes it waterproof. And before it leaves the DX Engineering Ohio headquarters, it is rigorously high pot tested. And the only place you can get this amazing new PL259 is on a DX Engineering coaxial cable assembly. And of course, these uh, DX Engineering assemblies can be fitted with pretty much any connector type that you need, um, like for instance, I've got some here in, in my uh, grubby little paws, um, BNC, if you need BNC. Uh, this one is a BNC patch cable, so if you've got a couple of pieces of test gear that you need to attach together, you got uh, twin BNCs. Here's one right here. Let me just put that back there, get out of my way. Um, this one has the uh, a nice PL259 on one side, and let's say uh, you need, well, there's another PL259 on the other side, and this one right here has the PL259 on this side, and then it's got pigtails. And, and look at these. That's right. They're heat shrunk. They're crimped. They're soldered. They're amazing. You need this stuff. Of course, if you want to build your own, you can do that. But uh, uh, why do that when you can get these professionally put together 
and tested by the folks at DX Engineering. You can get it either by the foot or in bulk spools, too. So uh, amazing. You get the patch cables or you can have custom links designed. Huge assortment of connector options, virtually any application. Like I said, custom links. And if you're going to roll your own, uh, high-quality professional cable tools will let you properly prepare your cable for a connector. There's a ton of these tools available. Each one is tailored to a specific cable and connector type, so you're always going to have the right stuff for the right stuff. And using the right stuff is essential to keeping your gear working at its highest potential. I want you to check out DX Engineering. They ship faster than anyone else in the industry. If you get your order in by 10 o'clock tonight, that's Eastern time, and it's in stock, it will be on a truck headed your way tonight. Wow, Santa Claus isn't that fast. Of course, he only runs one time a year. DX Engineering runs all the time. Proven products, expert advice. DX Engineering helps you shrink the globe. Grab your catalog or shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. dxengineering.com slash hamnation. Uh, of course, Tim Duffy uh, helping bring Tamitha Scove to Dayton. So, uh, man, call him up and thank him for that. And uh, DX Engineering, thank you so much for your support of ham nation time to head up to kansas where the uh the evil winds blow just like they do in oklahoma hopefully no tornadoes up uh, around you dale but uh, what's going on uh with our video pre oh sharp hat look at hey. you wow <laughs> well dx dx engineering you had the commercial had to wear the hat right now okay sure we may Why swap them up in a little bit but uh <laughs> everything's going good we had some hail here in the wichita area uh, earlier this evening on the way home from work uh, up to about a quarter size east of Wichita. So uh, it's definitely spring. A lot of wind blowing tonight here along the Yellow Brick Road. But we've got uh, three really nice viewer videos for you tonight. And we've got two more in the queue for the next episode. Right now, let's turn our attention to helping new hams. The Northland Aries and the hamlink.com website presented Ham 101 a bit earlier this month in Smithville, Missouri. With that report for Ham Nation, here's JD. He's in zero IRS. Welcome to the Ham 101 Clinic held at Fire Station Number Two, Smithville, Missouri, 7 March 2015. The HAM 101 clinic was a result of the coordinated efforts of Dennis Carpenter, KA0SXY, and Herb Fittick, NZ0F, from KCHAMLink.com. As you can see from this pan shot, there are over 75 people in attendance for the event. Herb NZ0F taught his HAM 101 class covering those first steps to include getting connected with clubs and Elmers, equipment selection, and on-the-air operating procedures. There was also a presentation from emergency managers from both Platte and Clay counties. Dan Harlow, KF0RS from Associated Radio, was on hand to answer questions about ham-related equipment. There was also a raffle for four NOAA weather radio stations. There was also handheld programming assistance. Fire Station 2 is also the home of the Northland Aries W0KCN and houses a complete HF station, VHF UHF, and APRS station. Volunteer examiners were on hand to conduct a technician, general, and extra class license testing session. And here are the testing session results. Three individuals passed both their technician and general class license test. And this young man who drove 50 miles to take his test had some great news for Ham Nation fans. Tell us who you are and where you're from. I'm Michael Peterson. I'm from Grain Valley. And what just happened today? I just took my technician and general exams and passed both of them. Congratulations. And how did you study and prepare for your test? I used uh, hamstudy.org. Also, I had the ARRL, ARRL Technician Handbook. And what got you interested in ham radio? Uh, I saw a post online of someone that had received SSTV images from the International Space Station and thought, that's pretty incredible. So that got you stoked to start studying for your ham radio license? Started me down the rabbit hole, and then I realized um, all the other exciting things I could do, and that was the start of it. I had the opportunity to ask Herb NZ0F about future ham 101 clinics. Uh, going to be repeated again, at least the HAM 101 part of this. The specific part about HAM 101 is going to be, we're going to do that at the HAM bag. 
uh, on April 18th for the Shriners Ham Bash. Uh, and I'm always looking for opportunities to come to club meetings and things like that and do this presentation. So I'm sure we'll do this another half a dozen times this year. For the Ham 101 Clinic in Smithville, Missouri, I'm J.D. Dupuy in Zero IRS. Thanks for watching. Well, thanks, J.D. The Ham 101 Clinic was geared toward the new or prospective amateur radio operator. And as he reported there, they did have a VE testing session also. Well, last week, Bob introduced our Ham Nation audience to Balans. This week, our wiki editor, Dan in 9LVS, follows up with a video tutorial. He's highlighting the basic fundamentals of Balans. This is basic fundamentals, balance. So what is a balance, and why would I be interested in it? By definition, a balance is an electrical device that converts between a balance signal, two signals working against each other, where ground is irrelevant, and a balance signal, a signal working against ground. A balance can take many forms. It may include devices that also transform impedance, but need not necessarily do so. Transformer type balance can also be used to connect lines of different impedance. The origin of the word balance is balanced to unbalanced. So you're thinking, how does a balance affect me? Well, let's put it this way. You've probably used balance and didn't even know it. Have you ever listened to music or watched television? Then you've used a balance. The television, for example, is connected to an antenna. Even if you have cable TV, the cable provider is hooked to some kind of antenna, whether it be a satellite antenna or an over-the-air antenna. In the case of the over-the-air antenna, that antenna uses a balance similar to this. This is a standard 300 to 75 ohm balance. In the case of music, balance are used extensively. Balance like this are used on microphones and musical instruments to change their analog signal into something that can be picked up by the digital processor. This is the most common schematic symbol for a balance. The left side on this symbol is the unbalanced side, while the right side is the balanced side. The easiest way to tell the difference is due to the ground label on the unbalanced side. There are basically two types of balance that we use in ham radio. They're the one-to-one -one and the four-to-one. -one. Both are constructed very differently. Let's look first at the one-to-one -one balance. The one-to-one -one balance is very simple. From the center conductor of the coax, you connect to the A lead. Then you come out of the A lead, at which point you put a connector to the output. You also connect to the B lead. You then come out of the B lead and go to the connector for the C lead. At this point, you pick up the ground from the coaxial cable. Coming out of the C lead, that is your final connection to the antenna. So A and B will be one leg of the output, and C will be the other leg of the output. And the input on A and C will be the input. So once we're done, it should look something like this. The coaxial cable coming in the bottom and the antenna itself coming out the top. The 4 to 1 balance is also very simple. You come out of the coax and you immediately put a terminator for the antenna output, as well as connecting to the A lead. Coming out of the A lead, you put a connection to ground of the coax, as well as the second connection to the B lead. When you come out of the B lead, that becomes your final antenna connection. So therefore our output is on the input of the A lead, as well as the output of the B lead. And our input is on the input of the A lead and the output of the A lead, as well as the input of the B lead. Once you've built your four to one balance, it should look something like this, with the coaxial on the bottom and the antenna lead on the top. Also. So, a prime example of a 4 to 1 ballon is your TV antenna matching transformer, which is a 300 to 75 ohm ballon. So what are the 1 to 1 and 4 to 1 ballons typically used for? The 1 to 1 ballon is typically used for a resonant dipole. It helps keep the current off the feed line. So the antenna looks like an antenna and the feed line is like feed line. The 4 to 1 ballon, on the other hand, is typically used for a multi-band dipole in conjunction with an antenna tuner. It allows for multiple resonant points on a random wire. And that's the basics on ballons. There are numerous types of ballons, as well as current ballons, coaxial ballons, the list goes on and on. I hope this video has been helpful. And 7 threes from n 9 l Yes. Well, thanks, Dan, and thanks for the Ham Nation Wiki you do every week and your great job maintaining a link to all the videos we show here at hamnationvideos.info. Well, how old were you when you earned your first ticket? I was 15, thought that was young. Well, Hope, KM4IPF is eight years old. Her license appeared in the FCC database just 30 minutes before an Oscar 29 pass back on March 11th. Her first contact was via satellite, and her dad, James WX4TV, shot this video for Ham Nation. Over. 
excited to be Say K4YYL. Kilo Mike 4, Alpha Delta Fox from Kilo 4, Yankee, Yankee, Lima. Wait. Go. Okay, go. K4YYL from um, Kilo Mike 4. Kilo Mike 4, India, Papa Fox Trot. Say Pacific, Pacific, over. Florida. Say Pacific. Pacific. Say Pacific. Pacific. QSL, Alpha Pacific, Florida. QSL, thank you very much. You're 5 and 9 also, 5 and 9 into Echo Mike 8 4. Echo Mike 8 4. And I'm in the South Carolina part of that grid. And my handle is Art, Alpha Romeo Tango. So back to you, and again, congratulations on your license and your first QSO. Uh, KM4 India, Papa Foxtrot, Kilo 4 Yankee, Yankee Lima, over. Say 73s. Say 73, and then give your call sign clear. 73. And here's my sister. KM4 IPF. Here's my sister, and I'm clear. Okay, isn't that fantastic? That's Hope's first QSO, and it was via satellite. It was made possible by Richard. He's W4BUE and his Earth station. Well, her dad, James, and Richard are both board members of the K4AMG Memorial Amateur Radio Club. That club's a 501c3 organization that uh, mentors kids in ham radio and other communications careers. Well, speaking of young hams, if Brian will bring up the picture, we've got Sam Haviland, KG45AYI, uh, and his dad, Chad, KG5AYJ of Abbeville, Louisiana. They both upgraded to general at the Louisiana ARRL State Convention in Rain on the last Saturday. They both got their tech license at the Ham Fest last year. They'll be going for extra next year. Well, here's Sam with his certificate after passing the exam. His mom, Sonia. <laughs> That's my buddy and, right oh, there. Seven That's my buddy. His seven-year-old brother had planned on testing for tech, but uh, they weren't quite ready. And we thank uh, Don Wilbanks, our uh, Ham Nation master man down in Louisiana for those great photos. Well, next time, we've got coverage of Radio Day. That's in Madrid, courtesy of 8 Yen. He's EA4GIL. I've got a super DIY video from Jim. He's in 3ROC. And wait till you see the homemade keyer paddle that he made from spare auto parts. <laughs> You're going to love it. Uh, plus, we've got another episode of Show Me Your Shack. So if you've got some shack photos, get them into us. We could use a few more for that episode. Send your shack photos and your videos to Ham Nation Videos at TWIT.TV. We'll get them to you. And Amanda has questions from the chat room next. Uh, good evening, Amanda. How's it going out in Canyon City? Any thunderstorms out there? No, actually, we had um, quite the significant snowstorm come through for about, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes, a little bit of rain, but no, no thunderstorms here. We'll we'll have to wait until about June to have those. So uh, thanks, though, for asking and awesome, awesome videos. 
Very cool. How is it? How could you make your first contact be a satellite contact? I couldn't even imagine a brave little girl there. Um, I didn't catch her name, but uh, congrats. And also to Sam, congrats for upgrading to a general. And a couple more announcements I have. Um, KD, no wait, excuse me, KB9 EWG Dave would like to say thanks to Gordo. He upgraded to extra and also Larry KC9 HDP upgraded to general this uh, last weekend because of Gordo. So I know Gordo's not on tonight, but thanks so much for that. And um, other than that, I have a couple of group questions so anyone can give their opinions. The first one is, what are your thoughts of a buddy poll antenna? Um, Dr. Bob, would you like to take it away? I have never personally used it, but I've been uh, <clears throat> been around some of the uh, field day sites that they use them, and it's it really works well for uh, just uh, packing in your bag and taking off. It's wonderful. That's what it's made for, but uh, it works really well. Uh, the only problem is that people want to make it work 160 through uh, 432. No, <laughs> but it works really good on the bands that it's. Uh, made for yeah they're they're really great i like it that they all pack up real well so that's uh that's a that's a good one okay one of, uh, our, one of our young ham of the year winners a couple of years ago patrick lasandra he and his mom went to cyprus uh, where his dad is from and they took a buddy pole and they made contacts uh from all over cyprus so yeah they do work buddy poles work pretty good i mean you got to understand the limitation it's a small antenna but uh, they work well so yeah it's, it's good stuff very good. Uh, Dale, any use of a buddy pole? I've never used a buddy pole, uh, but I think it would work out just fine. I like the portability, and uh, I like the way that uh, it gets out. We were watching some people use the buddy pole. In fact, I think Al, K1LTJ, one of our 40-meter post show net uh, uh, net control people, was uh, using a buddy pole on 20 meters there at uh, Dayton the year before last. Uh, when we all uh, got together and worked on the radio for the uh, special event uh, for the 100th uh, episode uh, way back when. Very good. And uh, that question came a couple weeks ago, I believe. And I think it came from this, the short shots that Gordo had shown with all those antenna installations on vehicles. So we appreciate that. And thanks for your patience and letting me get that asked to the group there. Uh, next question would be, and Don, I'm going to let you answer this just because I know you're going to have something funny to say. Um, so he wants to know if he's on the top of a hill or any on pulled over anywhere operating mobile. What? How do you um, handle a sheriff or um, getting reported as being a suspicious vehicle or doing something suspicious? Uh, what should you do? Why would you come to me with a suspicious person question? <laughs> do I look like <laughs> no, a suspicious? I, I turned my hat around because you know we're talking we're full of kids and stuff tonight and so you know i'm trying to trying to relate to the young folks so i got my hat turned sideways i know this this galls bob to no end and that's part of the reason why i did it but anyway um all you need to do is explain to him that you're an amateur radio operator and you should um keep a copy of your license in your glove box i keep a copy in my glove box i keep a little copy in my wallet just so i'll always have my license because anytime you operate your amateur radio you should have a copy of your station license on you that's why they give you the little wallet size deal but um all it takes is is for the most part you know showing them your license and explaining to them and being patient and don't ever lip lip off back to a cop uh and just i think if you just be patient you know you can explain uh, why you have a two-way radio in your car and what that weird, bizarre-looking antenna is on the back because <laughs> chances are he, he probably is not going to be real familiar with a big old Texas bug catcher or a screwdriver or something like that. He's, you know, probably uh, more used to seeing CB antennas. But that's the whole thing. Just be armed with information and know how to present it, the, the correct, proper information, and know how to present it. And that's that's the main thing. That's That's pretty much it with just dealing with police anyway, whether you're uh, uh, dealing with the uh, radio stuff or not, right? Oh, absolutely. I say invite him into the vehicle, show him who you can talk to, sure. and maybe he'll go get his license as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, and explain to him, you know, the emergency, all the emergency st communication things that we do, you know, uh, hurricanes and and, uh, you know, the fact that just, what, what a month ago that there was a, a bad wreck out in Nevada in, the, in a valley and the only thing that worked was ham radio to uh, get somebody extricated from a vehicle because a cell phone wouldn't work. 
Yeah, that, you know, that'll that'll open their eyes to the whole possibilities of what can go on with amateur radio. Oh, definitely. I'm not going to mention any names that the guy sitting next to me here gets pulled over all the time for speeding and they always want to know what all of his antennas are for. Mm-hmm. Well, he's an affair. Has not, has not helped him get out of a ticket yet, you guys. So don't try it. <laughs> um, just saying. Um, okay, Bob, this question is definitely for you. Um, Halger, and I, he does not have a call sign. He would like to know how the RF chooses what length on a fan dipole to transmit from. Run that by me. Get what length for what? What length on a fan dipole to transmit from? What? How does the RF choose what length on a fan dipole to transmit from? Sorry. On the frequencies, um, uh, you. It's very simple. It's it's a regular dipole, but it's like two of them, and they're tied together on the same points, shield and center, and then through a ballon so that you don't have any RF going back down the shield. But uh, the, the length of the dipole will be uh, the frequency uh, 486 divided by the frequency. And that's, of course, whether it's a regular dipole, a fan dipole, or what, but you have to have it resonant. And it works really good, better than with a piece of random wire and a tuner. You use a resonant dipole, and if you, I had one in Illinois for years, 75 and 40, and it's wonderful. No tuners, they work terrific. And uh, it, you need to look again at the, uh, uh, at the frequencies you're going to use for that. But uh, you, you can get by putting like three or four, but I don't recommend it. I, it works, but it gets pretty crazy because of some interaction but uh, just two dipoles work terrific. You look up uh, what frequencies you want to work, and away you go. And by the way, my hat is always on the way it was meant to be. <laughs> baseball cap. You see a baseball player. <laughs> <laughs> see? I told you. Oh, that's a, yeah, oh, that one. Is so oh, this is burns him oh, yeah. up, too. Look. Oh, he hates this. Oh, Don's the got it now. Base to it. <laughs> only rule is the catcher. And he has a purpose, but anything else, the hat is made just like that wonderful hat. Look at that hat. Come on, Look Dale, at flip that it hat. Dale has. Now around. that is a real cap. <laughs> Congratulations. Flip it around, Dale. Do it. Hey, flip Bob, it around, Dale. Right. Come on. Flip it around. Flip it around. Do it. Do it. No, Make no. it mad. Flip no, it around. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> I think it looks, you, looks better this way. Got, you, you know, have to be super yeah. for honest. Always Mine looks ready. Better. Mine looks so. better like this. Okay. Shush, shush. <laughs> okay. Bob, Bob, you've been talking passionately tonight in the chat room. We've all been watching you about your passion about having the right antenna for the right bands. Just go ahead. Give us the spiel. We would love to hear it. Well, it's, there's no spiel. It's science. You, you, a tuner only fools the transmitter. And you, that oh, this antenna's no, it's not working. Uh, it's it, it. The transmitter thinks it is, but a tuner does not make your antenna work better. It makes the transmitter like it and get a little more power, but it doesn't cause it to radiate better. And what you want to do is build an antenna that radiates has a pattern on that specific frequency you want to do. And I know I'm going to hear, oh, well, one antenna to work everything. Well, that's a dream. It'll <laughs> work. But no, it's going to find uh, a resonant place that the pattern works better where it's cut for. And I, I just, I have a passion against tuners because they fool people and then they think, oh, everything's fine. And if they could just get the antenna to be where you want it to be, tune the antenna. Use that antenna tuner for uh, book stops or something. <laughs> but, but, you get you an MFJ tuner, uh, uh, MF analyzer, and you will find out exactly where your antenna works best and uh, tell you where it's resonant. But there's nothing like a dipole, not a thing better than a dipole. George, you'd agree to that? We don't have George on at I don't the think moment, George but I bet he would. 
Don is stepping for in for George, and he's saying yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. So. Exactly. We're both in Mississippi. Yeah, I absolutely. have proxy. Yeah. I have proxy up in Jackson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I've used well, dipoles yeah. all my life. They're great. It, it's Very it's good. the only way. I, and and uh, I know it, you got to have a little room to put some up sometimes. But take four. I, I always say. Go, you don't have to work every frequency in the world to have fun on this in this hobby. Put up a 40 meter dipole. You know, oh, I can't do it. A 40 meter dipole is 33 feet each side. That's 60 foot. Your house is wider than that. And that is wonderful. It works so well. You can work the world on 40 meters with a dipole cut to the center frequency, like, like you, you learned a while ago. Uh, Randy showed you uh, if you got a down at seven megs. No, move it up about 7,200 in the middle of the band. You'll work all over, and you don't need a darn tuner. And it'll work great. And Oh, boy. You'll have that's, so much fun. That's great. And uh, that was our first antenna for HF, and um, pretty much what we still use now. So we enjoy it. Wire antennas, there you go. Hey, Bob, how did you buy anything from the Purple Store yet? Um. Uh, did, I'm amazed you haven't noticed my microphone. I went and got it off the shelf just for you tonight. It's just kind of a little personal That's thing so here great. between you and I. Oh, I found <laughs> a website, come... you guys. Go ahead. I said it didn't come from the Purple Store that you said. Oh, well, I think you should make a deal with them to sell it on the Purple Store. Um, no. Yeah. Hey, so anybody, um, I haven't been watching the chat since I've been uh chatting here um let's go over the net frequencies anyone have that info should be on 72 78 for 40 meters i haven't turned up the volume yet but i'm pretty sure we've been there the last five or six weeks in a row so uh okay. looking forward to it some static but i think uh, everything will work out pretty well tonight 72 78 very good. Um, let me see if I can see here the other ones. Uh, Don, did you catch any of the other uh, net frequencies? Uh, no, not the uh, not the HF nets. Uh, Echo Link, of course, is the Star Do Drop In Star a conference server that's node three five five eight hundred, and on D Star it is Reflector fourteen Charlie, and always some awesome people on both of those. So there you go. Okay, and, and I'm Steve, seeing here fourteen two sixty eight. Go ahead. Oh, uh, Steve, uh, W7UDI, usually hangs out as close as possible to 14268, uh, Amanda. Okay, and I am seeing that. They're they're putting on chat now, 14268, and Cheryl is always on 3847. So now you guys have all the frequencies for the nets. Um, I hope you can join us. Um Thanks for a great show. Once again, Christian did a great job tonight, too, with Marty. Marty, so nice to see your face. Love having you on chat. Uh, Bob, take it away. Well, that's great. Such a great night again. This show just continues to amaze me, and I know it does a lot of uh, the viewers, and we really appreciate everything. we got to be thinking we're going to have our 200th show coming up, and uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of activity around that. Uh, we're going to meet with Mike here in a couple of weeks, and... Uh, Oh, uh, Garlic Mike's going to get together with with everybody, I'm sure, that uh, was involved the last time. We're going to have a big time on the 200th show. Yeah, we've had our first meeting already. It's going to be great. Yeah, have you had it already? It, it really is. And, Bob, we uh, I uh, just got just looked at your text a second ago. Uh, we should announce right now while we're at it for the uh, booth uh, volunteers. I'll go ahead and take care of that this year. I've got the files already created, and I can... Uh, list them all out and uh, come up with a proposed schedule and take care of the paperwork for you and then uh, just turn the uh, schedule over to you as we get closer to Dayton. So they can send their uh, information to Ham Nation videos at TWIT.TV, just like they do their uh, shack photos, and uh, we'll get them uh, volunteered. So. Okay, that's great. All right, everybody heard that. He has volunteered. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you, Dale. Dale. Well, you did a great job last year, and uh, we'll get it all happening. Well, listen, thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you again next week right here on Good Old Ham Nation. Pass the word. And uh, for now, we're off to all the net frequencies, and uh, we'll probably catch up with you there. And meantime, why make it all happen and have fun. 
7-3 for now. Bye-bye for now. This is K9EID. 73. Saying hi, too.